I wanted to take and address this video that we placed up yesterday. It was actually placed, placed on Israeli News Live as breaking news regarding the Trump's U.S. Embassy move to Jerusalem will affect major biblical prophecy. Really seemed to uh, excite some people for the positive, but it also caused some of my own friends to turn against me because thinking that I must have impaired spiritual judgment as a result of uh, me seeing this laying in the scripture. And I can assure you one thing, I'm not here to, to tickle anybody's ears. I'm not here to make anybody feel better by the things that I say. I'm not afraid to tell you the truth and I will not pull punches when it comes to it. Um, but this whole issue of Trump, I wanted to kind of set the record straight for some people here and also share with you some deeper uh, things about uh, this issue here. Because the scripture in Zechariah doesn't say Donald Trump per se, but clearly in his administration, affecting his actions are clearly affecting biblical prophecy. And you have to remember as well, whether it be the Pharaoh of Egypt that recognized that God was living in Joseph and sided with Joseph, a man that was very pagan in all of his practices, uh, but yet God used this man. He used this man to, uh, to help elevate Joseph to the status that he was in and to save the children of Israel. Uh, using his own military might of that day. We can also look at uh, Cyrus and Darius. Uh, Nehemiah, or not Nehemiah, but uh, Artaxerxes, I might consider a little different there because I kind of feel like Artaxerxes may have been uh, the child of, uh, of Esther. Uh, some historians believe that. But when it comes to Cyrus and Darius, pagan kings all the way to the core. In fact, Cyrus on the Cyrus Cylinder actually claims to have ser serving the God of Marduk. All right, but did he do a good thing for Israel? Absolutely he, he did. Did he fulfill biblical prophecy? Sure he did. Okay, without a doubt. I don't care what his pagan ideas were, he still fulfilled prophecy. So when I look at President Donald Trump, do I have issues with him and his close relationship uh, to the Vatican? Yes, I do have issues with that. Uh, other things politically that he does, well, he's a politician, or he's not, he's a politician now, not to say that he was originally, but no, I don't agree with everything he does, by no means. But it doesn't matter who it is, whether it's Donald Trump, Barack Hussein Obama, President Putin, or Bashar al-Assad, or anybody else, I will show the good and the bad as I see it, especially when it comes to biblical prophecy. Same thing with Putin. Some people believe because I've stood up for President Putin over this whole issue over Ukraine that I think Putin's a wonderful guy. There's a lot of issues that go on inside the government of Russia that I don't agree with clearly and some very questionable things. But as long as I see right and wrong, I try to bring to you guys what is right and wrong. Now, let's get back to this because I really have looked into this even deeper over this prophecy here in Zechariah. And I wanted to share with you guys a little bit more so you can get a better grasp of what's being said here uh, biblically from this. So when we see the scripture here, it says, uh, just drop, just reading a few, few things out of here. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel, the saying of the Lord who stretched forth the heavens and the la laid the foundation of heaven, uh, excuse me, of the earth and form the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem, Jerusalem now, a cup of staggering or trembling. It literally, the Hebrew word that is used here is like a person that wobbles back and forth unto all peoples round about. So that's all the nations that are around Jerusalem. What nations, what pe not just nations, but peoples, period. All right, see, ha'amim. So, all the people round about, all right, are going to be just in awe over what's happening around Jerusalem. So that's including the Palestinians, that's including the people that are living in Gaza, that's including the Jordanians, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Lebanese, the Syrians, the Egyptians, the Saudis, all those that are living around there, right? All right, so he says here, Roundabout and upon Judah also shall it fall to be in siege against Jerusalem. Now it's not that Judah is in siege against Jerusalem, but the point is, is that they will be against both Jerusalem and against Judah. Who, what is Judah here in this case here? It's the house of Judah. All right, the house of Judah being the 
the, uh, the, the Jews that are living there today. Now, God identifies it as Judah. So those of you that are, want to write all these crazy comments in here, oh, the Jews in Israel today are not the real Jews. Well, I'll agree with you on one point. There are some there that are not real Jews. I don't doubt that a single bit in the world. But if we're going to say that one race of people are Jews because they say they suffered slavery, well, the Jews were in slavery too for 400 years down in Egypt. The Jews also were in slavery in the Holocaust just recently in modern history, uh, being in slavery to the German Third Reich again for, for four or five years there. So we cannot use this, guys. Please don't, don't even, it's just foolish to even go there. If, if, if the Jews that are, if, they're not, if there's not the remnant of Israel there in Israel today, then God is a liar and has not kept his word. I'll tell you that right now. Because there's no way that God, how could he keep his, how could he make his word come to pass if he didn't put a remnant there? Again, a remnant. That's why the Bible calls it a remnant of Israel that believes. So yes, you're right. It's not all them that are there are Jews. Okay, so... All right, but there is still a remnant that is there. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will make Jerusalem a stone of burden for all the peoples. All that burden themselves with it shall be sorely wounded and the nations of the earth shall be gathered together against it, against Jerusalem. Because 1947 uh, Resolution 181, the United Nations was trying to take Jerusalem away from the Jewish people that were living in this land, totally ignoring the 1922 edict by the League of Nations that was giving all the land west of the Jordan River for a Jewish homeland. But instead, the Jordanian people at that time were fighting to stop the Jews from getting anything, so they quickly moved in all the people into the West Bank there in Gaza, and they were trying to get a hold of Jerusalem so nobody could, could do anything with it. So now watch what happens. So all the nations are gathered against it, right? And what did we see? Notice the timeline, friends. The timeline is critical here. And all the nations of the earth shall be gathered together against it. So there's something that starts taking place that causes Jerusalem to become a cup of trembling for all the people. Something happens to cause the nations around Israel to get in siege over, over Jerusalem and against the Jews. Now think about it. Donald Trump on his campaign begins to start saying, we're going to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. You want to talk about making everybody freak out, including Barack Hussein Obama. And what does he do? He begins to make sure, along with the French government and others, to push forward an initiative to block Israel from becoming, or, or to go ahead and push forth this two-state solution to keep Israel from getting, uh, the Jewish people from getting a hold of Jerusalem as their capital. So in December, the 24th, we begin to see the second part of verse 3 come to pass. And all nations of the earth shall be gathered together against it. So what are they doing? All the nations, not only are they trying to stop the U.S. Embassy from being moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, but they're in siege, not only a, they're, they're in siege for Jerusalem and against Judah. The Jews being there or having anything to do with that. So it's a twofold fight right now. They don't want the Jews in Jerusalem and they don't want the U.S. Embassy being in Jerusalem either. Okay, so all the nations were gathered against it and they passed the resolution 2334 December, what was it, 24th or 22nd, December 22nd, I think it was, uh, it passed and then that was moving the rest of the nations to come together January 15th in Paris, France, where they met there and again, they were trying to stop and force Israel uh, to a two-state solution. It did not pass, but they still had over 70 nations gathered there against Israel and over Jerusalem. All right, then what happens? Notice the timeline. Trump starts it by talking about moving the embassy. It wasn't to say that they weren't already in a, in a battle over the fact of a two-state solution, but that starting it by talking about moving the U.S. embassy, which has been on the books since 1995, but the fact that he said he was going to do it, the fact that he had a delegation in behind him, religious leaders or, or Christian type people that were also influencing Trump's decisions on what he should do in order to gain, to, to strengthen America, okay? Because all, all Christians know, and I don't care 
regardless with them. Even Kenneth Copeland. I don't agree with Kenneth Copeland uh, sucking up to the Pope of Rome, but let me tell you something. The man does know if you bless Israel, God will bless you. All right? Michelle Bachman said it publicly that the Obama administration had totally ignored the scripture, the biblical promise that says, those who bless Israel, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. All right? But she said the Trump administration will not do like that. And that gained a major momentum of Christians that believed that Israel, that if you blessed Israel, you would be blessed. That brought the vote out by the Christians by the droves. Okay, so there were people that were influencing Donald Trump. Donald Trump may have not have known this himself, but I guarantee you one thing, those that were, those that were advising him knew it, and he heeded that, whether he did it from his own heart or not, doesn't matter. The fact is, he began to recognize that. If I stand with Israel, the people will back me as well, and no doubt God will bless me in return, right? So then what happens? All right, so he makes that decision, move the, move the, go ahead and move the embassy to Jerusalem. That began to inflame the nations over Jerusalem. That's what caused the scripture to begin to start rolling into that motion. It set the prophecy in motion. Moving the, the embassy set the prophecy of Zechariah in motion, right? Now, what happens next? Then the nations of the earth shall be gathered together against it. Against what? Against Jerusalem and against the Jews. And they did. Again, Resolution 2334 got passed in December, and then the United Nations all gathered on January 15th after Donald Trump's, right before he's getting elected, they come against them, pushing hard, pushing, fighting hard. Then what does it say in verse 4? In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with bewilderment and his rider with madness. They, the, the bewilderment. They're, they're, the, the horse, the, the, the horse is a military, represents the strength, the military. They're in amazement. They're, it's like they're dumbfounded by what's going on. And the riders that's controlling these militaries are flat lost their minds. Now, it appears to be just one rider, according to the way the Hebrew reads here. Very careful. His rider. And I think that's the United Nations force, personally. Could be wrong, that's my thought on it. And I will open my eyes upon the house of Judah. That's how you know it's the house of Judah. And I'm telling you, friends, if it's not the house of Judah and Israel today, then God can't keep his word. So when you go to sit there and say, well, it's the black people that are the Jews. I love black brothers and sisters. And I tell you what, I'm a firm believer in the Ethiopian heritage that Moses married an Ethiopian woman according to passage of scripture, okay? And we have Ethiopian believers that are there in the land today. But I'm going to tell you something. If you think that all the Jews in Israel today are not the Jews, then God is a liar and cannot keep his own promise. When we're seeing the prophecy fulfilled right before your eyes. Okay? And get the, get the blinders off. Oh, it's Donald Trump. Oh, Donald Trump. Oh, my God. He loves the Pope. Well, I don't like that either. Well, he don't love the Pope anyway, but he's, he stands for the Catholic people. Doesn't the scripture say in Revelation 18, 4, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins. All right? That means God's people are inside that Roman Catholicism, not just Roman Catholicism, but also inside of her daughters too. They're part of the Baptists, the Methodists, Presbyterians, the Pentecostals, the Lutherans, and what have you more. Why do you think God sends two witnesses in this day to begin with? Because all these churches have got it right? If they've all got it right, why hasn't Israel recognized her Messiah? Something's gone wrong, hasn't it? Something went wrong, and God knows it went wrong, and I'm going to show you by Scripture where you went wrong. All right? Now, so, he's, now it says, And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah. Not the house of Israel. The house of Israel is all messed up. She's going to get it right, don't worry. But, but right now, she's all messed up. So when this begins to happen, when those nations come against, come against Israel, against the house of Judah, and against Jerusalem, just recently, all right, and what you saw happen, and also in January, right? Now God's eyes 
are open to the house of Judah. Do you realize that set it in motion? The first thing that set it in motion, Trump said he's going to move the embassy there. That caused all the nations to go bonkers over this. Then the United Nations, Obama, all of them, don't veto at this time. Don't veto Resolution 2334 because we're going to make this two-state solution come in here. What was? Do you know Obama was fulfilling Scripture when he did that? Barack Hussein Obama was fulfilling prophecy right here in Zechariah by causing the United Nations to gather together against it. So yes, Obama was fulfilling Scripture too. All right? But now God has opened his eyes to the house of Judah because of this. Now, I will smite every horse of the peoples with blindness. That reminds me of Revelation where it says, thou art, talking about the Laodicean church, you are, um, uh, what is it, blind, miserable, and naked, and don't even know it. Blind. Yeah. They're all blind. Every one of their horses are blind. God opens his eyes to Israel and they're too blind to recognize it. I can't help but when it says, see, because notice what it says right here. Bekol sus ha'amim. Each and every horse of the peoples. Maybe that's the churches. Maybe while God is starting to turn his eyes to the house of Judah, the churches are too, the leaders of these churches are too blind to recognize the prophecy of God being fulfilled. What a shame. Then it says here, this is where we get it right here. And the chiefs of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength through the Lord of hosts, their God. In other words, I am strengthened. They say it, notice they say it in their heart. Why? Because you got to be politically correct today. We can't dare say as the President of the United States that America will be made strong as long as we stand with Judah. You can't say that, can you? You can't say it as a politician. You know, and, and I'll, I'll give you another one too. Lindsey Graham. There's a whole lot of things I don't like about Lindsey Graham. I don't like his beating the war drums against Russia and a whole bunch of other things I don't like about the man. But you know what? He'll stand with Israel. Okay, But a lot of the administration of Donald Trump stands with Israel. And God will bless them for that. They don't say it out loud. They say it in their heart. The inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength. Through the Lord of hosts, their God. That lets you know the chiefs of Judah has nothing to do with the parliament of Israel today. Has nothing to do with the Knesset, I should say. It has nothing to do with the Knesset. It's not Rabbi Yehuda Glick. It's not uh, any of the other Knesset members that are there. None of them are these chiefs or chief friends would be another way to put it, or champions of Judah. And you know what's funny? It's the word champion. Look at Google Translate. Let me just show something with you here. I already pumped, pumped, popped this in here. They are champions of Israel. I just typed it in English, did it in Google Translate. And what does it say right here on the board here? Him elofi Yisrael. In biblical times, aluf is not the way we translated the word champion. There's a different word, like the champion that, that when, when David went out to meet uh, Goliath, and Goliath was a champion of the Palestine, Palestinians. Different word altogether. But elofi, the exact same word, friends, the exact same word that we have here in Hebrew, alufi, plural. Ve'amru alafu alafui Yehuda. And the chiefs of Judah, or the champions of Judah, Belibam Amatza Li Yeshvi Yushalayim. See, the chiefs of Jerusalem shall say in their hearts, Belibam, Belibam Sinfante, in my heart I have hidden, beautiful song. All right, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So they know that it's their God, by the way. That's another important part here, too. Uh, see, it says the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all right, the ones that have control of Jerusalem right now, which is who? The house of Judah, yes. The house of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all right, are my strength, Amatzah, that's my, Amatzah Li, see, it's actually reversed backwards, Amatzah Li, all right, my strength, 
uh, Yashvi, the one sitting or living in Jerusalem, Be Yahua, in, in, the, in, uh, in the Lord God Hashem, Sabaot uh, of armies, Ha Elohechem, their God. That's how we know the chiefs have nothing to do with anybody that is Jewish. It's someone outside of Israel that are the chiefs or the champions of Israel, right? And the ones that are the champions of Israel are, gonna sh are showing up on the scene right after what those nations have gathered against Israel over not just the house of Judah, the Jewish people, but also over Jerusalem. All right? Now, so as I said, uh, and then look what we have here. Let me, let me just show you. You talk about the peoples all gathered together against it. Kings meet with U.S. Jewish leaders over the peace process. That's King Abdullah's on there. And I can guarantee you one thing. He was the first one to go to the United States. When, when Trump began to talk about moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, he didn't even ask for the invitation. He, went, he got on his plane and flew there and said, if you do it, it's going to bring unrest to the Middle East. So Trump's got a lot of people against him over this. It's not a popularity contest he's trying to win either, friends. It's not a, comp comp uh, not a popularity contest. Trump's U.S. Embassy pledge fires emotion over Jerusalem. Hmm. The Palestinians warn relocation would be a flashpoint and end the U.S. role as a peace broker. Some have dismissed it as an empty campaign promise. Others have warned that it could be a spark for another bout of violence of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Either way, Donald Trump's pledge to move the U.S. Embassy in, uh, in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem has triggered a wave of emotion across the Middle East. So you don't think that that's not what caused it? A cup of trembling? For all the peoples, it's triggered a wave of emotion. All right, now let's take a look at some other things here that I, I, I've just got to, to, to deal with. Oh, by the way, I wanted to share this with you too. There's a lot of articles out there. I just, I just threw this in just to see if it was even out there. I put on there, champion, Trump champion Israel. Sure enough, Israel settlers hope Donald Trump will be their champion in the White House. But friends, I gotta, I gotta say this to my Jewish friends as well. It's not that he's going to be a champion for you for the West Bank. That's not what the scripture promised. In Zechariah, he promised it for Jerusalem. Okay, for Jerusalem. Now, before I go any further, before I go to the next part, I gotta go back to Zechariah 12. But let, me, let me share with you how, why this is so important. All right? It also says, verse 6, In that day I will make the, let's just put the word champion the way they got it translated modern, the champions of Judah like a pan of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire among the sheaves, and they shall devour all the peoples round about. On the right hand and on the left, Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. This may mean that Donald Trump is going to be dealing with the nations that come against Israel and have to stand for her may very well mean that. The Lord also shall save, watch this, verse 7. This is the kicker right here. you got to look at the time frame of this, friends. And the Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem be not magnified above Judah. And that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem and, the, and, the, and, the, and he that stumbled among them at the day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as a godlike being, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon them the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look unto me because they have thrust him through, and they shall mourn for him as one who, for, who uh, mourneth for his own son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. What are you talking about? Do you realize the prophet Zechariah is saying when these things are happening that you're seeing happening right now, this is also when the Jew, the Jewish people, the house of Judah is going to recognize this one that was thrust through. This one, as the King James calls it, was pierced. Not the hands and feet, I don't think. I think it's when the, he was, when the Roman soldier drove the spear into his side. I think that's where it's at. That day they shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of uh, Hadad, uh, Hadad Rimon and in the valley of Megiddon. 
and the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, their wives apart, goes into Levi, Shemai, and even uh, those families that remain. What is it speaking about? That's the house of Judah. Nathan and David were from Judah's tribe. Levites are the Levite tribe. The Shemai was from the tribe of Benjamin. Friends, I could do another message on that altogether, but let me just show something to you. And this is what really gets me, because when people start criticizing, saying, oh, I can't be Trump, oh, I can't believe this or anything, let me, let me show you something. Let's first start, let's hit Romans here real quick. Romans chapter 11. All right, Romans 11, Paul speaks about how that the wild olive tree, all right, was grafted in. The Gentiles were grafted in to the, to the tree while the branches were broken out. The Jews were broken out because why? They rejected the word of God. And they rejected the Messiah as being the Messiah. And they were broken off in the wild olive branches. The Gentiles were grafted in, right? So now as Paul goes into all this, and he says, and, and if it by grace, then there's no more works. Otherwise, great. Okay, we'll get past that. Uh, he starts talking about the, the branches being regrafted in again, right? For I speak to you Gentiles, in so much as I am the apostle of Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by me, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh and might save some of them. I understand that. I am Jewish as well, so it does matter to me trying to win my people to Yeshua. For it is the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. What shall be the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Ezekiel 38, 39, war that's about to happen. Life from the dead. These dry bones, right? For if the first root be holy, the lump is also holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches are broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Okay? For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not you. See, so many people want to condemn the Jewish people. Oh, they don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah yet. You know what? You're going to find out why they don't recognize him. It has a lot to do with the messed up doctrines that have been crammed down their throats. All right? Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou were cut off the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. You know what he says right there? the Greek word in there, that you should not be ignorant, that means without knowledge. Lest you should be wise, the word conceit, in your own doctrines. That's where, that's where everything went wrong. People have no knowledge. Not to say that people are not blessed. I, please don't get me wrong, my friends. I know I'm scolding right now, but I, don't, I love you guys. I know many of you guys are blessed. God deals with you. I'm not saying he doesn't. See, but so too many of them, they're just wise in their own conceits, their own doctrines. Let me show you what happens to those doctrines. Hosea, how many of you guys remember about Hosea, where God commands him to go out and marry the prostitute? To give it a sign to Israel. He has two children by her. One of them, uh, he's, uh, she's to call Ami. The other one, uh, Rahua. My people is, is Ami, all right? And actually, he's going to call them Lo, Lohoruma and Lo Ami. You're not my people. Eloha Ruma, all right? Now, notice what he says here, right here. Say you unto your brethren, Ami, and to your sister, Ruhuma, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband, and let her put away the harlotries from her face and the adulteries from between her breast. Lest I strip her naked and set her forth as in the day when she was born, and make her as a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. And I will not have compassion upon her children, for they are children of harlotry. And a lot of people get this mixed up. Ami, by the way, the daughter that, that she has there that becomes later, Lo Ami, you are not my people, is the house of Israel. 
Rehumah is the house of Judah. Now, what's interesting, the entire prophecy, and I did a message on this. You can go look this up, and if I find it, I'll try to put it in the link here below for you. Uh, Rehumah is the house of Judah. But notice what happens. The whole prophecy here in Hosea, for the first say, five or six uh, uh, chapters here, clearly deals with Israel. First, the house of Israel going into captivity. That's when he changes them and calls them, Lo Ami, you're not my people. Rehumah, also dealing with the house of Judah, it speaks about the coming of Yeshua and how Yeshua would be rejected. But also remember what Yeshua said to his apostles, go only to the lost sheep of the house of what? The house of Israel, right? And then when they came back, we see in the prophecy of Hosea, Hosea don't say no more that they are not my people, but you are what? Ami, you are my people, right? But watch what happens. I want to show you something here. Let's, let's just for the sake of time, let's jump over here to chapter 4. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is what? No truth, no mercy, no knowledge of God in the land. Swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery. They break all bonds and blood touches blood. There doth the land, there, therefore does doth the land mourn and everyone that dwelleth therein doth languish with the beast of the field and the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fish of the sea also are taken away. Yet let no man strive, neither let any man reprove for thy people are, they, are, are as they that strive with the priest. Therefore shalt thou stumble in the day, and the prophet also shall stumble with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I also will forget thy children. That was a prophecy of the house of Israel. See, what happened? The house of Judah received him, a remnant. Not all of them did. Their mother didn't receive him, remember? He said he'd let her go desolate. That was the Pharisees and the Sadducees that did not receive Yeshua as Messiah. But the, a remnant of the house of Judah, through the apostles, through the 120 in the upper room, and then the 3,000 that converted and stuff, this is where it began. The movement began. And then they went to what? To the house of Israel. Because why? Yeshua said to, to the 12 apostles and the 70 that he sent out, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So the gospel began to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel while Yeshua was still on the earth. But what happened? As the years went by, in 365, when Constantine decided to make the Catholic Church and have a state religion, you begin to water down and the Word of God begin to depart from you. See, the house of Israel has intermingled in with the Gentiles because of being dispersed through all the world. And the house of Israel, many of them are in the United States today. And many of them are professing believers in Yeshua. But God's prophesies right here and says, you know, you like, you, right here. He says, yet let no man strive, neither let any man reprove, for thy people are as they that strive with the priest. You know, none of them get along. Can't agree with this one, can't agree with that one. Therefore shalt thou stumble in the day, and the prophet also shall stumble with, with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. My people, now he's talking, see, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They rejected knowledge. This is what caused Judah also to not know who their Messiah is. This is why God's got to send two witnesses. People say, oh, it's the Old and New Testament. No, it's not. Old and New Testament's not going to lay dead in the street for three and a half days and resurrect either. No. Now, I'm not saying that it couldn't be a type, you know, Prophecy does have compound fulfillments. I agree with you on that. But it's not what it is. He's got to send two witnesses because the house of Israel that should have evangelized the world ended up 
making a compromise, some of them, not all of them, made a compromise with Constantine. And then they went through the world killing all the true believers. And now we're at the place we are today. This is why it says in the Bible that 10 people of the nations will take hold of a skirt of him that is a Jew and say, show us your ways. We hear that God is with you. You mean the Gentiles have got to take the hold of a skirt and say that we hear God's with you, show us your ways? Guys, this is not the Messianic movement either. This is not Hebrew roots or any of these things. If it was, then why are you taking the ways of the house of Judah then? No, the Gentiles take the hold of the skirt of the Jew and say, show us your way, we hear that God is with you. Well, let me tell you something. Right now, we can't say that about Israel. We can't say that about the house of Judah because God is not with them as of yet. His eyes are turning to them though right now because we see the prophecies, we see everything lining up according to the Word of God. He's not going to forsake them. Soon they will see the one that was thrust through. Soon this prophecy will continue to fulfill itself in modern times. And soon, not only will the Jewish people of today recognize their Messiah, but the Gentiles also will recognize that God is with them. And then you will say truly, God is with you, show us your ways. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing? Anyway, friends, thank you for watching. It's hard to, uh, I don't mean to be so scolding on you guys. Um, I do want to ask one thing, one uh, blessing from you, and that is there are a few other things that we're going to need to do on this trip going to Israel after speaking to the people that have the conference center there. So a few things that we're going to have to either purchase or rent or something like that for this trip to, to, to be more successful if you'd like to be a part of that as well. Uh, you could go to our website, israelinewslive.org or israelreturns.com. That's .com or Israel Returns. I'll put, a, I'll put both the websites in there. You can just copy it, paste it, and put it in there.